All right, are there any questions based on what we covered last time? So towards the end of the last lecture, I was trying to give you examples of activated carrier molecules, right? And one example that we discussed in detail was ATP, right? Adenosine triphosphate. And we've also talked about the ATP, ADP cycle, right? I also talked about uh, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, ADP, that is adenosine diphosphate, then AMP, which is adenosine monophosphate, and I also mentioned about cyclic AMP, right, which is a signaling molecule used in the cell to indicate a low energy state. Right. Now, another activated carrier molecule right, in the cell is uh, what is referred to as NADH and NADPH. Right. And uh, let me go to the diagram on the, on the um, next slide. Right. Because I think all this text stuff over here, all this textual stuff is best explained after looking at the diagram. Right. So this is the structure. In this diagram, you see the structure of NADP plus and NADPH, right? The difference between the two is that uh, the diagram on the left, all right, is the oxidized form. If you add a proton and two high energy electrons, okay, which is basically one electron and a hydrogen atom, right? If you add a proton and two high, high energy electrons, so that gives you H minus over here, right? H minus then you get the, the molecule on the right, which is called NADPH, right? So notice that the, the portion that is indicated in yellow over there, right? That's the thing to notice, right? So, so the molecule on the right, right? It has the property that it has that, those two high energy electrons, right? Stored along with the proton, right? In, in, in that uh, hydrogen atom that is uh, indicated with the yellow, right? So if there is a reaction, if there is a biochemical reaction that needs high energy electrons, this molecule on the right can easily go to the molecule on the left, all right, and give up those extra electrons that are needed, okay? And it is called an activated carrier molecule because once it's in this state where it has those high energy electrons, it can move, move about freely in the cell, right? And then where those electrons are needed, that's where it can go back from NADPH to NADP plus, all right? And, uh, you know, be ready to kind of char uh, be charged up again with high energy electrons, all right? So all this other stuff here at the bottom is not important, right? But you should note that it does contain a nucleotide. You have an adenine here, right? Remember, I made a statement towards the end of, I think, chapter two, saying that, you know, the nucleotides don't occur only in nucleic acids. They also occur in activated carrier molecules, right? And you have already seen an example of that, all right? ATP, adenosine triphosphate, that's a nucleotide with a sugar, right? And then a phosphate, all right? Now, why is it with a nucleotide? I don't know, okay? But that's the way it occurs in nature, all right? and the ATP-ADP cycle. Similarly, this molecule also, this is NADP plus and NADPH, they also are kind of tagged onto, the, onto, the, onto a nucleotide, right? And now, so, th so this, is, this is the one that has a phosphate, okay? Notice, th there's a phosphate group at the bottom, right? On each side, right? Now, you can also have molecules like this. They look exactly the same, except that the phosphate group is missing, right? If the phosphate group is missing, then the oxidized form will be NAD plus, right? And the reduced form will be just NADH, right? Exactly the same kind of role. But these, these two different sets of molecules, they control different reactions, okay? So now I think we've seen the, the picture and the picture is always worth a thousand words, so we know what's going on, right? Now I can go through the text, right? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, sir. Oh, the, the hexagon, you mean that, this hexagon here? It is basically a ring compound, okay? It's, it's got a six-member ring, right? Remember, we, yeah, there are... Coupling. Coupling between what? Yes, 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 yeah. Carbon or nitrogen, you know, so, yeah. No, no, wait, 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 wait. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four. Uh, it can be either carbon or nitrogen, okay? Like nitrogen is three, okay? The valency is three, right? So at the bottom, it is nitrogen, right? But the other others, uh, I don't think it can be. Well, I mean, I don't know whether, whether that one uh, represents uh, like a double bond or something like that, okay? I'm not, I'm not sure about that, but you're right. Carbon has got a valency of four. So it's possible that there is something else over there, okay? I would have to look at the exact compound, okay? I don't think that's even given in the book because this picture is reproduced from the book, all right? 
Yeah, the valencies and all those things will balance out. I, I wouldn't, I'm not worrying about that, you know, because there are chemists and other people that have made sure that what is there is, is correct, you know, so. But yeah, that's something that you, probably it's your assignment, okay, look that up. Look up, even in this day and age, if you look on, look on the internet, right, do, do a Google search on all this NAD plus and NADH, okay. You should be able to find it on Google, okay. Everybody uses it, right. Maybe not as engineers, but anybody that is doing any biology is using that, okay. So look in there and then come and tell me next time, okay, whether those are carbons or not, okay. I thought they should be carbons, but, but it looks like, yeah, if, if it's only three of them, three bonds over there, that's not a carbon, all right. Nitrogen is three, you see that at the bottom, okay. So maybe at those locations there is nitrogen, I, I don't know, you know, because the detailed structure is not given, because the important point in this slide is that addition of the proton and the two high energy electrons, okay. All the other stuff, we are not interested in the details here, okay. So this is the NADP uh, P plus and NADPH, and similarly you have NAD plus and NADH. Right? So let me go back to the previous slide, and now we are in a, in a better position to understand what's written here. So you can see NADH and NADPH are important electron carriers, and they supply reducing power that is needed for certain reactions. NADP plus is the oxidized form of NADPH, that's the stuff uh, that we had on the left, right? Uh, NAD NADP plus uh, contains, and it's called NADP because, see, the full form is nicotine amide uh, adenine dinucleotide phosphate. Right? I'm not asking you to memorize that, but, you know, that's what it is, right? That's how you get NADP, right? Nicotine amide, because the, the, the ring is a nicotine amide ring. So, so look up, when you do your search on the internet, look up under nicotine amide ring, okay? and see what those atoms are, okay, whether there's any carbon or it's nitrogen or something else, right? So if you add a proton, which is a hydrogen ion, okay, because hydrogen has got one proton, one electron. You take the electron away, you got the hydrogen ion, that's a proton, all right? So by adding a proton and two high energy electrons to NADP+, plus, you obtain NADPH, which is what I showed you in that picture, okay, from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, all right? NADPH provides strong reducing power. Why? Because it has got those high energy electrons, right? Where there's reducing power needed, it can give up those high energy electrons, right? And NADH and NAD plus differ from NADPH and NADP plus respectively in that the bottom phosphate group is missing in the former, okay? And that's what I pointed out in the figure, okay? Okay, so here's the picture. And NADH has got a role as an intermediate in the catabolic system of reactions which generate ATP, right? So if you study those reactions, like let's say from your food, right? You eat food, uh, if you're having carbohydrates, right, that ultimately enters as glucose, right, into your bloodstream, and then your cells have to basically oxidize that glucose to produce energy, right? So the energy that is released, we said it has to be stored in the form of ATP, right? Because you're going to oxidize the glucose, the carbohydrate, and then the energy that is released has to be stored in the form of ATP, all right? And as an intermediate, there will be high energy electrons, okay? If you go through the steps that are involved in oxidizing glucose, along the way, there will be, there will be ATP generated, but there will also be high energy electrons generated, okay? And those will be carried by NADH, all right? I'm not covering that here, but if you take a course in, like, physiology or nutrition or something, they will go through these things, all right? how you, you basically start with a molecule of glucose and then, you know, start producing energy from that. Right? There are two steps in that. The first one is called glycolysis, which is without oxygen, right? Uh, you just um, break up the six carbon sugar into two, three carbon sugars, right? And produce a little bit of energy. And after that, you use oxygen, right? And that's where, when there, there is something called the electron transport chain, right? Just like you have in electrical engineering, all right, I mean, there's a flow of electrons, all right, that produces energy, right, I mean. Or if you have something that is moving, you can generate, your cells do that all the time, okay. Across the cell membrane, there is a potential gradient, right, and there is, uh, you know, there, there are enzymes that are called ATP synthase, which will couple, let's say, the energy in the high, uh, high energy electrons, all right, to the, to the charging of molecules of ATP into ATP and so on, okay. It's very similar, but there are entire chapters in the reference book that I've given you, there are entire chapters that are devoted to this kind of stuff, okay, how you break down food and, uh, you know, how you get energy from glucose, all right, and, and so on, and, and also how energy is generated, okay, how ATP is formed, okay. But again, I mean, that, that would, like, uh, 
take us too far aside, right? Because that is not, we, we are electrical engineers, so right? at least I assume most of you here are. Okay, and you're interested in using engineering methods in the context of genomics. You're not interested in becoming a molecular biologist, okay? You don't want to get, you're not interested in becoming a mathematician, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. There is a math department here. There's a biology department here, right? So that's why we are not going that deep over there. But I'm just telling you for your information that stuff is there in that very same book that I mentioned as the reference. Right? So if you want to look up, you can. Right? And looking it up once wouldn't hurt. You know, you at least acquire some extra knowledge. Now, on the other hand, this molecule NADPH, it operates with enzymes which catal catalyze the anabolic reactions, that is the biosynthetic reactions and supplying the high energy electrons that are needed to synthesize energy rich biological molecules. Because remember we said before that for the most of these uh, anabolic reactions or biosynthetic reactions, right, these are energetically unfavorable. So you need a lot of energy right, to get them going. You have to have coupled reactions and so on. Okay? And NADPH is one molecule that uh, makes that possible. So you can see that these two different classes of activated carrier molecules the cell uses different activated car carrier molecules for different pathways. Okay, for breaking down, you know, uh, let's say glucose and producing energy, it's using one set of activated carrier molecules. Sorry. For uh, biosynthesis of components that it needs, it uses another set of activated carrier molecules. Right. So the cell is able to exert independent control over these two different pathways. Right. Doesn't mean that if you start producing glucose, you're going to mess up something else. Okay, you're not going to be able to synthesize. You can do those independently. So there is some kind of decoupled control in the cell. Yeah, yes, sir. Right. Activated carrier molecules. Activated carrier molecules means something that is kind of charged up and it can be used to move energy freely in the cell. Okay. High energy electrons, energy or high, uh, it, it may provide energy like ATP, right? You have ATP, you have GTP, guanosine triphosphate, right? A ATP, GTP, CTP, TTP, all right? Remember, there are four possible nucleotide bases, A, G, C, T, okay? So each one of them, you can have triphosphate. They can, they can be activated carrier molecules. For some reason, the cell uses ATP pretty much most of the time, okay? The energy thing is the ATP. At the same time, it could, it could be in the high energy phosphoanhydride bonds or the energy could be stored in high energy electrons, okay? So in NADPH and NADH, the high energy comes from the high energy electrons, okay? Not from the phosphate bond. Okay, so it's a little bit different, yeah. What are the difference Between what? Oh, no, 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 the difference is one of them is used to break down, like, let's say you, if you've had glucose, okay, your cell has to break down glucose to get energy, okay, so that is a catabolic pathway, where you're trying to break down something, you're really interested in the energy, all right, the other pathway is where you're trying to, let's say the cell needs some, uh, some, uh, some molecule, all right, so you have to manufacture that from scratch, right, or it needs to produce some protein or something like that, okay. Because the cell needs many different things, you know, it's, each, each cell is like a small factory, right? So, and it has to be pretty much self-contained. It has to produce all the proteins and things like that that it needs, right? And so those would be the biosynthetic reactions or the anabolic reactions, where you're not breaking down anything, you're trying to build up, right? Like one might be manufacture of glucose, the other one might be breaking down glucose, okay? So sometimes you want to burn, uh, you know, glucose to produce energy, sometimes you want you have some energy from somewhere and you want to store it in, in glucose, all right? So the, the two different reactions are controlled by these uh, two different kinds of activated carrier molecules. Yes, sir, yeah. High energy electrons, yes. No, no, not directly, but maybe, look, the way it works is there might be a reaction where NADH is produced, okay? ATP is not directly produced. First, there can be reactions where ATP is directly produced, but the one I'm talking about, oxidation of glucose, maybe NADH has been produced. It has high energy electrons, right? NADH has high energy electrons. So the NADH can go along the cell membrane, okay? There will be a potential gradient, right? It's just like generating electricity across a potential gradient. If you have an electric field, all right, you move something in there, right? You produce energy, right? I mean, you know about the, all this electromagnetic stuff, right? Right, I mean, the principle of the DC motor and then the, whatever, you know, uh, uh, DC motor and the generator and all, is the same principle, okay? 
So across this thing, the electron will flow down the, the gradient, all right? And then, you know, there is some motor kind of thing that is called ATP synthase that will convert ATP into ATP, okay? There is actually, on the cell membrane, there is something that is called the electron transport system. So it is very, very similar to what we do in electrical engineering, all right? Cells do that all the time, okay? That's how they are going to produce, uh, you know, it's just like, you know, you have water flowing down a hill, okay? You take the potential energy, all right? And you generate, you have, a, you know, a rotating machine and you, basically, in a magnetic field and you generate energy, okay? It's the same kind of thing, right? And in, in fact, there is a chapter in that book that is devoted to these kind of things, sorry. And there are different steps. It's, it, again, it's in different stages. It's not a one-step generation, okay? There is a complex one, complex two, complex three, and so on, okay? It's like water coming down. It comes down here. You store some of the energy. It comes down some more. Store some of the energy. The cell does that all the time. But every time you're storing the energy, you are basically charging up ATP molecules, adenosine diphosphate you're converting into, into adenosine triphosphate for later use. And these, electro, these NADH, NADPH, they supply some of the high energy electrons that are needed to basically kind of run your generator, right. sort of. All right, any other questions? All right, another molecule, right, activated carrier molecule, another really important one is what is called acetyl coenzyme A, all right? You remember, okay, uh, we, to we talked about Acetic acid, all right, which is CH3COOH, right? So you have the acetyl group, which looks like this, all right? Let's again look at the picture. What you have to the left of this arrow, all right, that is the acetyl group. CH3COOH is acetic acid. That's the acid you find in vinegar. You take hydrogen away from that, you get the acetyl group, right? The molecule that you have in the, on the right, right, this one is called coenzyme A, right? This molecule on the right. And I don't even have the entire formula. It's more complicated. I put the dots in the middle because I didn't think that was relevant. Right. But you can look up. Again, this is a very, very popular molecule. I mean, we get even unimportant things on the internet. Okay. So this one, if you look up acetyl coenzyme A, you will get the entire thing on the internet. And they will give you you know, a whole page or maybe a few page description of acetyl coenzyme A. So this is the coenzyme A molecule. All right. And notice that this also contains a nucleotide. Okay. Why, I don't know. Through evolutionary time, this molecule contains a nucleotide. It has an adenine, it has a ribose, all right? It has the phosphate, and then, you know, to the five prime end, it has something else attached, okay? All, all of this stuff. But together, this is known as coenzyme A, okay? Now, what is acetyl coenzyme A? When, see, you have coenzyme A, and it gets linked to an acetyl group, all right? Through a bond between, uh, that uh, gets attached to that sulfur atom, okay? All right, this is called a thioester bond because it involves a sulfur atom, right? So this is a, the important thing to remember is that this is a high energy bond. Just like in ATP, you have high energy bonds, right? Because that's a high energy bond in ATP, that's why ATP can be used for biosynthetic reactions because you can break down that bond, right? The free energy change is highly negative. You can combine it with some other reaction where the free energy change is positive, but the net free energy change of the two reactions together is negative, right? Same thing can happen here because this is a high energy bond, okay? That's easily broken. Breaking that bond is an energetically favorable reaction, right? So if you want this acetyl group that CH3C double, uh, double bonded with O transferred onto some other molecule, right? A neat way to do that would be to start with acetyl coenzyme A. This high energy bond is broken, right? And the negative free energy change from here is able to tag that acetyl group onto that other molecule, okay? And, and when you are... When you're breaking down glucose, all right, there are certain steps where you have to convert some, I'm sorry, no, not breaking down glucose, like uh, you have to convert something into acetyl coenzyme A. Because this, this molecule, this acetyl coenzyme A, this is the molecule where, uh, you know, in the, what should I say, processing pathway where carbohydrates and fats meet, okay? See, if you start with carbohydrates, that's going to be broken down ultimately before your body absorbs it, it's going to become glucose, right? If you, if you start with fats, okay, let's say you've eaten a lot of fats, okay, you have fatty acid, okay? So, so in the beginning, like when you're trying to get energy from, from glucose, first you run glycolysis, you get, you know, you break uh, six carbon sugar into two, three carbon sugars, all right? Doesn't require oxygen. But after that, the, the molecule that you get from there, that is converted into this acetyl coenzyme A, 
Okay? And this is also the entry point where fat, if you started out with fats, they will undergo some processes and that will also produce acetyl coenzyme A. Okay? So this is like the common point, acetyl coenzyme A, whether you start with glucose or you start with fats, okay? as they are getting processed, they are first processed differently and then the common junction where they meet, okay? where, they, where these individual parts have lost their identity, that is acetyl coenzyme A. And that one is then oxidized with oxygen all right, to produce carbon dioxide and water. Right. So this is a very, very important molecule for uh, you know, physiological and nutritional studies, all right? acetyl coenzyme A. Again, I mean, we don't have to delve very deep into it, but I'm just letting you know that, th that this is actually the state of affairs. So to get back to your question, you know, you asked me last time, what is a group? This is another example of a group, acetyl group. All right. So you can have many different kinds of groups. <clears throat> Okay, to summarize this chapter then, uh, we've seen that all the activated carrier molecules, they contain a nucleotide, right? So this is thought to be a relic from the RNA world because, and I'll talk more about this later, because, you know, today you have proteins that function as catalysts. You have DNA, which is just the, uh, you know, molecule for storing information, right? Unchanged over generations. We'll talk more about that later. And RNA is the intermediate, but People think, you know, at least some people think that life originated in an RNA world where you had all these nucleotides and all that, right? And what we are seeing is the, is the leftover from there, okay? That's why even in, the, in, these, in these molecules where the, where the nucleotide doesn't seem to have any function, somehow or the other it's there, okay? So ATP is the only one among these molecules that is involved in actual nucleic acid synthesis because ATP is needed to produce DNA, okay? DNA, R RNA, and so on, okay? I, and I'll show you how. So one important take-home message from this chapter is the important role that is played by activated carrier molecules in biology. The condensation reactions, because remember I said all these condensation reactions, the biosynthetic reactions, they are energetically unfavorable. All right? So you need high energy you know, bonds to be broken to make those reactions go forward. So the condensation reactions involved in the synthesis of polysaccharides, that means the sugars, the complex sugars, proteins from amino acids, and nucleic acids from nucleotides, these are all powered by the energy derived from ATP hydrolysis. Hydrolysis means you have ATP, you break up those phosphoanhydride bonds by the addition of water mole molecules. Right? And that, that actually drives this re these energetically unfavorable uh, or order generating reactions forward. All right, any questions? Then we move on to the next chapter, which is about proteins. And this is a pretty long chapter, right? It's going to take me a few lectures to get through it. Uh, proteins are the most versatile functional molecules found in a cell, right? They are responsible for carrying out nearly all cellular functions. They constitute most of the dry mass of a cell. So most of the characteristics that you have, they are due to proteins, right? Signaling molecules, those are proteins, right? Insulin is a protein, right? Hemoglobin is a protein, right? The color of your hair is determined by what protein your hair cells produce, right? So, so let's look at a few examples. So you have proteins that are called enzymes, right? Remember I, I mentioned in an earlier chapter, I think in the previous chapter, that enzymes can speed up reactions by a factor of 10 to the power of 14. Those are all proteins, okay? They are basically one out of those 20 amino acids linked together by peptide bonds, right? And f having the right shape to make, uh, make the right reaction take place, right? So proteins pro uh, serve as catalysts. Then proteins serve as signaling molecules from one cell to another, right? Like, say for example, you know, if, if you have a cut, right? right? If you have a cut or a wound, right? Your cell division has to be turned on, right? I mean, because otherwise the wound is never going to heal, okay? So how is that turned on? There are signaling molecules, like on the cell membrane, right? There will be a receptor, right? When, let's say, the platelet from, the, from that cut comes and binds that receptor that stimulates the cell to divide, okay? So the signaling takes place through proteins, right? Then like the signaling to your brain, right? If you want to move, right? all that signaling is done through proteins, right? Then proteins serve as moving parts of tiny molecular machines, right? By the time we get to the end of this chapter, you will see how a protein can walk like you and me, okay? Because the protein can generate directed movement, right? Uh, then these guys, these antibodies, right? 
the things that are used basically to give you all those immunization shots and all that, those are all proteins, right? Toxins are proteins, right? Even if you get bitten by a snake, correct? That snake venom is a protein, right? It's a protein that is going to interact with your cells and kill you cell by cell, okay? That's the reason why it's so bad, you know? And, and, and that's why you have to get to the, uh, you know, emergency room quickly, right? Because they can give you the anti antidote that will neutralize that protein, right? Be so the hormones, they are also proteins, right? Like uh, insulin and so on, all of them are proteins, right? And as I mentioned earlier in this class, that there are fish in the Arctic Ocean, you know, that use antifreeze, right? We use antifreeze in cars. In the Arctic Ocean, they have proteins that function as antifreeze, right? Now, for protein structure is everything, okay? They have exactly the right shape that is needed for the specific function for which they are designed. So proteins adopt a large number of different three-dimensional shapes, and thus they can perform versatile functions. And I gave you an example, like hemoglobin has got exactly the right shape, right? Right number of amino acids in the right sequence, so that it has the right shape to bind an oxygen atom and carry it from the lungs to the tissues, right? So the shape of a protein is specified by its amino acid sequence because the protein is made up of different amino acids that are linked together by peptide bonds. We already covered that earlier, okay? So a protein molecule is made from a long chain of amino acids. So each amino acid in the protein molecule is linked to its neighbor by a peptide bond. And the repeated sequence of atoms along the chain is referred to as the polypeptide backbone. Because remember, if you have a bunch of amino acids that are linked together by pe peptide bonds, what is the only thing that is differing? Is the side chain, okay? Everything else is the same. There's an alpha carbon, there's an amino ter uh, terminus, there's a carboxyl terminus, right? Uh, all these look similar between different amino acids. The only thing that is different is the choice of the side chain, right? So the side chains are unique to each protein and they are crucial in determining its distinctive properties, right? Because, uh, you know, some of the side chains might be acidic, some of them might be basic, some of them hydrophobic, some of them hydrophilic, and so on. Okay. Now, proteins fold up into different shapes because of different sets of weak non-covalent bonds, right? So when you have a long protein molecule, right, it has different amino acids with different side chains, right? So they have different properties, right? So there are a lot of different fo forces of interaction. So the first one would be hydrogen bonds, right? If you remember, when we looked at proteins, there was a nitrogen and hydrogen sticking out, and then there was a carbon double bonded with oxygen, right? Now I said that, you know, when you have ni nitrogen, and that has got a lower affinity for, for electrons than hydrogen, right? Similarly, oxygen has got a lower affinity for electrons than, uh, let's say, uh, carbon, right? So because of that, you'll have some uneven charge distribution, right? And the hydrogen, if, if it's po uh, positively charged, slightly positively charged hydrogen uh, atom, right, it will link up with slightly negatively charged oxygen atom, right, and it will produce hydrogen bonds. So that's one set of bonds that you're going to have. Very weak bonds, but you have millions of them, right? So they can produce significant effects. Then you can, could have ionic bonds, right? Depending on, you know, if, if in the protein there is some other molecule where there's an, uh, there is uh, some other charge bond. Then you could have van der Waals attractions. This refers to the fact that if you have two atoms, if you bring them too close to each other, right, they will repel, right? If they're too far away, they'll attract, okay? So they have to be at a certain distance, all right, in order to maintain equilibrium. Then you also you'll have hydrophobic and hydrophilic forces because, you know, you, a protein might be having side chains, okay? Or an amino acid might be having some side chains that are hydrophobic that hate water, some others which really love water. So that a protein, if you put it in, in, in a watery solution, it'll have a tendency to fold up in such a way that the portion that loves water stays in contact with the water, the portion that hates water stays away from the water, okay? And I give you a very, very simple example of that in the, on, the, on the next slide, right? So this, and again, this is a hypothetical example. So you have a, a protein with four amino acids, two of them are polar, that means they love water, two of them are non-polar. So if you throw, throw that protein in water, okay, in an aqueous environment, so uh, the, the polar and the non-polar side chains are shown over there, but then that will fold up in an aqueous environment, it will fold, fold up in this fashion, so that the part that likes water, right, is facing outside in, in contact with the aqueous environment, the part that hates water stays away from the aqueous environment, right.
So this hap happens automatically. And if you have a large protein with many amino acids, there will be, you know, the final three-dimensional shape will be the net result of all the different interactions that take place, right? And people haven't figured out how to determine the structure of proteins. Like if you know the amino acid sequence, that's a big problem. If one of you can do that, you know, you can become really famous, right? Because given us, uh, you know, an amino acid sequence, all right? Can you figure out, you know, how that protein will fold up, all right? Looking at all the, and there are people probably in physics and chemistry and all who work on that. There are people in computer science who try to do that using some kind of modeling, right? And this is important because many times, many of these drugs, right, for targeting particular diseases, they are proteins that have a specific shape. So if I know that the molecule that I'm trying to target has a particular shape, all right, I would try to create a drug that will fit in exactly over there, right? So I need a protein with that shape. If I have it, then, then I'm done. Okay, then I can block the activity of that other, other molecule, right, that, that I'm trying to target, right? So the question is, what sequence of amino acids should I use to come up with that drug? Again, another open problem, right? Nobody has solved that. If you sol solve it, you'll become famous and really rich also, okay? If you can develop it and, you know, the drug companies will be interested in talking to you. No, they will. They will, you know, you'll become a celebrity, right? So, overnight, because that's a big problem, right? And, and we don't know how to do that, but nature has figured it out, because, as I said, hemoglobin has exactly the right shape, right? If you go and mess it up a little bit, it loses its function. Now, a given protein will fold into a con conformation of lowest energy, right? We know that from thermodynamics, right? Even we know that from control theory, right? I mean, that, you know, the lowest energy conformation is the most stable. Right? If you have a pendulum, right, you let it swing, it will going to come, come to rest over here at the stable equilibrium. That's the lowest energy one. Now, a protein can be unfolded or denatured by treat, treatment with certain solvents. But the amazing thing is that when you remove the solvent, so suppose you have a protein, you treated it with the solvent, the protein lost its shape. Then you remove the solvent, it will go back into the same conf uh, conformation, okay, exactly the same shape, okay. So that is, it's like the, that shape is in its DNA, in, in the protein's, I mean, if I can use that kind of term, you know, that it's in, in the protein's DNA, okay, or in its bones, okay, it's just going to fold up that way. Now, uh, some terminology, sometimes inside the cell, you have some proteins that are referred to as chaperone proteins, okay, because they help other proteins fold up, because inside the cell, the protein is produced, right? When it's initially produced, it's not folded up, like it's, it's like a connection of amino acids, then it has to fold up into the right shape. The shape that it will fold up into that is determined by its amino acid sequence, but it may take a long time to fold up. The chaperone proteins basically assist, they speed up the folding. It is not going to alter the final shape of the protein, but it will make the process a lot faster. Now, proteins range in size from about 30 amino acids to more than 10,000 amino acids, okay? And you can imagine, like if you have 10,000 amino acids, okay, how many possibilities there are at each location? There are 20 possible side chains, right? So it's 20 to the power of 10,000, okay? That's the number of proteins that you could have of that size, all right? But do you find them in nature? The answer is no, right? Because not all of them have a fixed shape. If you don't have a fixed shape, you're useless, okay? If you're not consistent, okay? If the protein does not consistently fold into a particular fixed shape, it's useless, you know? One day if it falls this way or another day, that way, it, because the shape, for example, if you're looking at hemoglobin, the shape of oxygen is not going to change from day to day, okay? It has got a fixed shape, right? Now, the majority of the proteins are between 50 and 2,000 amino acids long, and the conformation of a given protein is very complex. Right? However, there are a few common structural motifs that underlie the various conformations. Because if you have something that is 2,000 amino acids long and you want to figure out how it exactly folds up, you know, that's going to be quite complicated because there are so many different forces that you will have to take into account. Right? So, but there are some common structural motifs okay, that are studied. And these motifs facilitate a general study of protein structure. And we will look at a couple of them, okay, the main ones. Right? And usually if you look at a protein, you'll find that it'll have this structure, or a structural motif, and then there'll be things on top of that. So the two of the most popular structures are called the alpha helix and the beta sheet. Right? And these structures result from hydrogen bonding between the NH. Remember, an amino acid has got an NH2 on one side and a C double bonded with OOH on the other, right? I mean, that's an amino acid. When you link two amino acids together, right, you create a peptide bond where you have an N 
bonded to an H, okay? And you also have a C double bonded to an O, okay? So naturally, as I said, you know, there will be some uneven charge distribution, all right? Because hydrogen has got a lower affinity for electrons than nitrogen, so hydrogen will become positively charged, all right? Very slightly, but it will acquire a net positive charge. Similarly, oxygen will acquire a net negative charge, all right? So, and throughout this polypeptide backbone, right, there will be these NH and COs, NH COs, all right, all over. So, there is a potential for that H in the NH, all right, the positively charged H to link up with the negatively charged O, all right, in the polypeptide backbone, regardless of what the side chains are doing, okay, and it can produce some kind of a structure, right. So, these two structures are quite common because, you know, they don't depend on the properties of the side chains. And uh, so they can be formed by many different amino acid sequences. So let's look at them one by one, right? The first one is what is called the alpha helix, all right? It looks like a helix where between every fourth peptide bond, see, every peptide bond, you have an NH and you have a C double bonded with O, okay? Every fourth peptide bond, the hydrogen, all right? See, the hydrogen here is getting linked up to that oxygen over there through a hyd weak hydrogen bond, all right? And this thing is taking a, it's like a spiral, right? It's like a spiral like this, all right? And then there are hydrogen bonds that are linking the hydrogen and the oxygen. All right? Every fourth peptide bond is linked together. Right? And again, I mean, there are chemists who have done all these calculations, okay? The alpha helix, I think, was introduced by uh, probably Linus Pauling, right? So these are Nobel laureates. Like, Linus Pauling got Nobel Prize twice, right? I think there are only two people, like it's Madame Curie and Linus Pauling. Okay, they're the only two people that got Nobel Prize twice. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Why is it helix? Yeah, because, because that's probably the conformation of lowest energy. All right? But see, what is going to happen, and let me show you on the next picture, I think. No, actually, there is text here that is explaining that picture. Okay? So the important thing to note is that there will be a hydrogen bond for every fourth peptide bond in, the, in that uh, protein chain, okay? Why there, what? Maybe there, have, there, is, there are constraints of bond length and things like that, okay? Because if they're close enough, then the bond will form, if they're too far away, maybe it doesn't form, I don't know, okay? There will be deeper uh, reasons for this than I can go into, or I possess expertise to explain, you know? Because, uh, but yeah, if you, uh, again, if you want to dig deeper, you probably would have to look at some books on, on uh, chemistry or something like that, you know. But, uh, you know, lots, lots and lots of people have worked on these things and they have worked these out, okay. So this is an uh, example of an alpha helix. They, again, again, this is the diagram. On the next slide, I'm basically just using textual information to, uh, to explain that. So alpha helix, when is the, an alpha helix generated? When a single polypeptide chain turns around itself to make a rigid cylinder, okay? This chain is turning around itself, all right? And then a hydrogen bond is formed between every fourth peptide bond, okay? So again, I mean, remember, a hydrogen, uh, the peptide bond has got an NH sticking out, C double bonded with O sticking out, all right? The H in the NH is going to bond with the O in the C double bonded with O to give you your hydrogen bond. So every fourth peptide bond, there will be a, uh, there'll be a hydrogen bond linkage, right? And this gives, and again, you have to do the math. I have not done it. But this gives rise to a regular helix with a complete turn every 3.6 amino acids, okay? Somebody has done the math doing all the calculation, okay? Not somebody, lots of people have done the math. You know? It's just that it falls outside my area of expertise or interest, you know, to go and do those calculations, you know? Because you have to remember, you know, I did not do any biology after after high school, okay, after 1978, right? I didn't know, and then in 2001, I started reading all this. So I don't have enough time to go and find out all of the, uh, you know, all those bond lengths and the reasoning behind it, right? Now, sometimes you will have alpha helices that wrap around each other to form a particularly stable structure that is called a coil coil. So you might have one alpha helix like this, all right? Another alpha helix, and then the two of them are wrapped together, they'll form a stable structure, right? That can also happen. You have that in your hair, okay? Then, if, if you have a protein, okay, that crosses a cell membrane, because sometimes you may have a situation, okay, that there's something that comes outside the cell, all right, some signaling molecule, but a signal needs to be transmitted to the interior of the cell, okay. 
So for that to be possible, you need some kind of a transmitter okay, that goes through the cell membrane, right? No wireless transmission, right? This is a landline, right? So you will need something, and remember the cell membrane is a lipid bilayer, okay? So you will need some, some kind of a receptor outside, okay? And something that goes through the, through the cell membrane, and usually when it goes through the cell membrane, it'll go in the form of an alpha helix, all right? Alpha helix will go through the cell membrane, and then at the other end, it is doing whatever work it has to do, all right? So, uh, and the reason it'll go as an alpha helix inside, inside the, or, or the benefit of going is that what is going to happen is that whatever is hydrophilic, all right, that will stay in, towards the interior of the helix, away from the lipid bilayer, because the lipid bilayer hates water, okay? Right? And then whatever is hydrophobic, hydrophobic side chains, they will be facing the lipid bilayer. Okay? That's how the transmembrane po protein will cross the lipid bilayer. And that's shown on the next slide. All right? So again, this is the lipid bilayer. Again, and by now you know why you have one head and two tails, okay? The head is uh, hydrophilic, all right? It likes water. And the tails are hydrophobic, they stay away from water. So as the, the protein is crossing the lipid bilayer as an alpha helix, right? The hydro, uh, and there will be hydrogen bonding, the appropriate hydrogen bonding from the alpha helix. But the hydrophobic side chains, they will be facing the lipid bilayer. The hydrophilic side chains, the, the ones that love water, will stay away from the lipid bilayer, so they will be towards the interior of the helix. Okay, any, any questions so far? So that cover, does our treatment of alpha helices, all right? Then the next special kind of motif that we have, it's called a beta sheet, right? Now, beta sheets can form either from neighboring polypeptide chains, which run in the same orientation, that is parallel chains, or a polypeptide chain that uh, folds back and forth upon itself, that is anti-parallel chains, okay? And I think if I go to the next, slide, I can show that to you clearly. So you could have parallel chains like this, like you have a polypeptide chain that is running like on the right hand side, they're parallel to each other, right? And again, wherever you have a peptide bond, you have an NH sticking out, a C double bonded with O sticking out, okay? So in between these two, like let's say the top one and the next one, there will be hydrogen bond linkage, right? Between the NH and the C double bonded with O, okay? The H and O will link up. That's how the beta sheet will be formed. So this is an example of a parallel one, but it could also be anti-parallel, anti all right? Where you know, from there, the ch chain is continuing in the opposite direction, right? And, and again, you have hydrogen, bond that, uh, hydrogen bonds that are linking the, uh, the, the, the different sheets, okay? So this is also a pretty stable structure, and it does not depend on what side chains you have in that protein, right? Because it, it is only dependent on the formation of the hydrogen bonds between the NH and the C double bond erythro. Right. So this is another common structure that is found in, in proteins, one, one common structural motif. Yeah. Yeah. No, in one case, see, the, the, the one on the right, on all of them, on all of these blocks, the amino term, you know, see, it's going from left to right. Do you see that? Okay. No, no, that connection is there, but, but the difference is that it's going from left to right, okay, left to right, and then the hydrogen bonding will take place, okay, between these, these individual arrows, okay, hydrogen bonding will take place. Here the arrows are pointing in different directions, so, it, I mean, they call them anti-parallel sheets because it's going in this direction first, and then instead of, you know, coming back here and then starting the sheet, it's just coming back this way. Difference between what I didn't understand. Which, uh, yeah, maybe we talk later about this. Okay, I, I'm not quite clear exactly what you're asking. You know, but. and again, I mean, this diagram is a poor diagram. If you want to look at the good diagrams, look in the book or or on the internet. Okay, type alpha helix, type beta sheet. Okay, it will give you much better diagrams. You know. This is my drawing, okay, from the book I simplified it because I just want to get the main message across. So, 
So beta sheets can be formed either from neighboring polypeptide chains that run in the same orientation, that is, they produce parallel chains, or it can be formed by a polypeptide chain that folds back and forth upon itself, that is, anti-parallel chains, which I showed on the previous, or actually on the next slide. These sheets are held together by the hydrogen bonds that connect the peptide bonds in the neighboring chains. That's what I said, the NH and the C double bonded with O. Both these types produce a very rigid structure. Right. And uh, I've already shown you the figure, so I can go on to the next slide and talk about the level of organization in proteins. So the three-dimensional structure of a protein can be studied at four different levels. Right? The first one is the primary structure of a protein, which corresponds to the amino acid sequence. That really has the information for the entire shape of the protein. It's just that we don't know how to go from the amino acid sequence to the structure for most, most proteins. Right? Then the next level that you study the protein structure at is what is called the secondary structure, which is basically uh, the existence of alpha, because the protein, if it's a large protein, has many alpha helices and beta, beta sheets. So you try to identify where the alpha helices are and the beta sheets are. Okay. Then the third structure will be the three-dimensional conformation of the protein, the actual three-dimensional structure into which the protein will fold up. And the last one is what is called the quaternary structure. This corresponds to studying the complete structure for proteins that are made up of, these, so these are more complex proteins that are made up of more than one poly, polypeptide chain. Okay. So you'll have to first determine this, the three-dimensional structure of one polypeptide chain, then of the other, then see how the two of them come together to produce the final three-dimensional conformation for that uh, complex protein. Now again, some terminology. A protein domain is produced by any part of a polypeptide chain which can fold independently into a compact stable structure. So you have a polypeptide chain for a protein. If a part of this can independently fold into some structure, right, then you call that a protein domain. So a domain usually contains between 50 and 350 amino acids, and it is the modular unit from which many larger proteins are constructed. So now we talk a little bit about the evolution of proteins. In theory, as I've been pointing out, okay, because at every location you have 20 possibilities. So in theory, a large number of different polypeptide chains could be made. For example, if, you have a, if you're looking at a polypeptide chain that is 250 amino acids long, there are 20 to the power of 250 different possibilities. Okay? Only a small fraction of these would adopt a stable three-dimensional conformation. Right? And proteins which do not have a single stable conformation are not biologically useful because in, in one situation it might function one way, another situation it won't function at all. Okay, it's not biologically useful. So hence, you know, bio, and you know, nature has a, its way of eliminating anything that is not useful. Right? It's the survival of the fittest. So hence, they have been eliminated during the process of evolution, and you don't see them. Yeah. Is there any way what? Uh, based on theoretical considerations or how? I mean, if, uh, if someone gave me some, like, uh, confirmation. Uh -huh. No, you, you don't have that. Even, again, I mean, to figure that out, I, I'm not aware that you can uh, figure that out because, see, if you could figure out whether it's stable or not, you would be, the first, first step before figuring out whether it's stable or not is to figure out whether you can predict what the shape is going to be, right? I mean, yeah, we, we don't have a method for doing that. And people in physics and all, they use X-ray crystallography to figure out, you know, produce the protein and then look at the shape and all that stuff. But mathematically, just starting from the amino acid sequence, we really don't know okay, how to do it. It's, so uh, we really cannot figure out which shape is stable or not. Uh, I mean, if we look at uh, some, like, experiment, we see some structure in the biology, some, 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 uh, some, some species. Then you can say that, that structure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. someone yeah. gave me one structure, I cannot say that. No, you cannot. Criteria yeah. to say if it is stable or not. Yeah, you cannot, yeah. You'd have to do more experiments to figure out, you know. But if it is in biology, if it's hemoglobin, it's having the same shape, okay, in, in every organism. It is stable, okay. And we know that in those cases where it loses that structure, like if somebody has sickle cell anemia, they have real problems, okay. It can be a life-threatening disease, all right. Like each one of us, we would be in real bad shape if the proteins in our bodies did not fold up into the right shapes, okay? Because a lot of hereditary diseases are associated with some defect, okay? Defect in your DNA in the code for the protein because of which you don't have the correct shape, a protein with the correct shape, all right? 
and you lost function, right? Because you have to be producing those all the time. So a present day protein has got a single stable conformation with properties that enable it to perform its function. For example, consider the protein hemoglobin found in blood. This protein, as I've been repeatedly saying, has exactly the right 3D shape that enables it to bind oxygen atoms and carry them from the lungs to the tissues. And once a protein evolves into a stable conformation, its structure could be modified slightly to enable it to perform new functions. Right. And such proteins that can be grouped into protein families. Like the hemoglobin you have is slightly different from what I have, slightly different from what he has and all that. Okay, so they're still functional. Right. And members of each such family display many similarities, including their three-dimensional conformation. They have to because the oxygen atom is not going to change its shape for you and me or whoever else. You know, and we are all breathing and surviving. Now, large protein molecules often contain more than one polypeptide chain. And in each polypeptide chain, in this case, is called a protein subunit. The subunits bind to each other by weak non-covalent bond. When the polypeptide chains are identical, we call them dimers, right, made up of two polypeptide chains, tetramers, which are made up of four polypeptide chains. Right? Other proteins contain two or more different types of polypeptide chains. For example, the protein hemoglobin contains two identical alpha globin subunits and two identical beta globin subunits. Now, proteins can assemble into filaments, sheets, or spheres, and they can, protein units can bind to form a very long helix or a circular ring. And I think I'll stop at that. Probably there is a picture. So let's, let's stop with this picture. For example, you could have, you know, two units of proteins, all right, that fit into each other and they form a dimer. Okay, at the top you can see. Then you could have, you know, proteins that look like this, they have those two binding sites, something sticking out and something else that you can stick something in. So you can link these two up together, you can get a helix, all right? or you can even get a ring. Right? So proteins are pretty versatile that way. So let's stop here for today and I will continue from here next time. <laughs>